I'm Steve Mencher, News Director of Northern California Public Media. I'm here with Assistant News Director Adia White and Dr. Sundari Mace, uh, Health Officer of Sonoma County, Susan Gorin, Chair of our Board of Supervisors, and Christopher Godley, Director of the Sonoma County Department of Emergency Management. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. It's been a heck of a day for my guests especially. They've really changed everything about how life is going to be in Sonoma County in these next three weeks. And I wanted to start with you, Dr. Mace. And uh, you gave a uh, presentation to the department, uh, to the Board of Supervisors today. And tell us a little bit about what you told them. Well, I think I'm going to start right now with an update in the situation because I'm sure everybody will want to hear about that first. So since we talked last week, we've had a lot of different developments in the coronavirus update. So right now in California, um, we have 394 positive cases that have been reported. And as you can see, the, um, uh, the reasons for these cases have been shifting. Now we have about 71 travel-related cases, but we also have 68 person-to-person -person, uh, transmission cases. In other words, someone who has been diagnosed who has a known contact to someone else. We also have 80 what we call community-acquired cases. And as we discussed last time, this means somebody who's diagnosed in the community who doesn't have any contact to anyone with coronavirus and also has not traveled to any place where there's a lot of cases. So this is increasing, and we see we have a lot of people under investigation. Uh, there have been six deaths so far reported in California, and still the cases are largely happening in adults. You can see we only have six cases occurring those under 18 years old and uh, about 200 in the 18 to 64 age group and 116 in, in older folks over 65. So moving to our situation here in Sonoma County, we have four additional cases, and I think people have probably been following this in the news. Um, two four of, for a total of? For a total of six, but we did uh, take out the one case that moved to a different county. So we had one person we were just keeping here off of that initial cruise ship. So uh, we have a total of six, two from the Grand Princess cruise ship. And then since Saturday, there's been four additional cases that have been diagnosed. Two that we feel are uh, community transmission. In, in fact, we had our first case of community transmission here in Sonoma County on Saturday. One that we think is travel related and one that's still unknown. So that's our situation here now, and I want to move to a very interesting graph that I want to show people that will set the stage for the rest of our discussion. So here is a, a, a graph that's based on some modeling. So in other words, predicting what would happen if you did certain things, certain interventions. So you can see here at this graph that if you didn't do anything without any protective measures, and you know we're already doing certain things like social distancing. So without any protective measures, you would see a rise in cases, as you can see in the red um, graph there, that peaks and then comes down steadily. Now, if we put into place certain protective measures, like more social distancing, even what we're going to talk about, which is shelter in place kind of interventions, then we're hoping we will flatten the curve. And you can see in the blue um, graph there that we'd have cases occurring more slowly over a longer period of time. So what this allows us to do is to deal with the situation effectively. In other words, you can see the line in the graph that shows health care system capacity. So if you didn't put any of these protective measures into place, you might overwhelm our health care system. In other words, the ICU beds, the uh, triage capability, the physician and nurse uh, capability to take care of people. And this is what we want to avoid. Sure, and we'll talk a lot more about there that There you go. So later. With, yes. So I'll stop there and, okay. and uh, let you go on. Well, sure. So today, about two hours ago, you issued an order, the order that everyone was waiting for, um, for people in Sonoma County to shelter in place. Yes. Uh, tell us what that means, and uh, uh, let me ask you first uh, a bit of a hard question. Why did it take so long? People 
in the county want to know. Yesterday, the six counties were in, and then Santa Cruz County was all in. Why didn't we go with them? Why did it take an extra day for us? Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, so shelter in place basically means that you stay at home and don't leave your home unless uh, you're going to do so for essential activities, to participate or work in essential businesses, or for essential travel. And uh, we'll go into that in more detail, mm -hmm. but we feel here in Sonoma County that we've been very proactive, actually, in uh, issuing this health officer order. The reason why we are behind one day from the other counties is because our situation is quite different. Uh, we have counties like Santa Clara that have 140 plus cases now, and many of the other counties that have 20, 30, 40 cases now, and we were still at two until our surveillance system, the enhanced surveillance that we put in place, detected the first additional case on Saturday. So we feel that we, the time to us having community transmission to actually putting the order in place is much shorter than for the other uh, counties, and so we're kind of on top of it. All right. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions that have come in about this order, and we can get into it in some depth. And I also want to remind everybody not to forget that if you want to have this whole uh, program in Spanish, you can tune in if you're in Santa Rosa or anywhere in this, near the Santa Rosa area to KJORFM 104.1 La Mejor. Let me remind you again, that's KJORFM 104.1 La Mejor to have a simulcast in the Spanish language. All right, so here are some of the questions that came in about what some people are calling a lockdown, mm -hmm. uh, what you're calling shelter in place. Betsy Donnelly, uh, Sebastopol, Sonoma County. If Sonoma County ends up on lockdown and we are allowed outside to exercise, how far from home are we allowed to travel to take that exercise? And can we use our car to take ourselves there, for example, driving to the coast or the lovely Annadale Park? Um, yeah, great. Um, so basically, it's not a lockdown. Let me make that really clear. <laughs> okay. So that shelter in place is not a lockdown. It's not a lockdown at all. And okay. in fact, um, people will be able to go outside of their house for obviously for seeking medical care, to go to the pharmacy to get your prescriptions, for going to the supermarket to get food, to take your pet to the veterinarian if you need to do so, and definitely to go out simply for uh, a walk you know, to rec recreational parks, I'm, and you can get in your car. Uh, the whole point, however, is to try to keep people at home as much as possible. So it's perfectly okay to get some peace of mind and go outside of the house, but uh, to minimize the distances traveled would be the best, and to minimize the number of persons you come in contact with is also the whole purpose. So social distancing, keeping six foot away from people around you, if you're out and about, would be great to do. Okay, let me ask Lori's question from the town of Sonoma. In the event of a lockdown, people are really wanting to call it a lockdown, will people still be allowed to go to laundromats? Some of us have no laundry facilities available in our buildings and need to have a way to wash our clothes. Uh, de definitely, again, it's not a lockdown. Um, but uh, I'll say it's shelter in place, and we can refer to it in that way. Okay. But yes, uh, laundry is a considered an essential um, business, so it, you definitely could do that. All right. You answered this question I I mostly, but uh, let me ask it from Wes Williams from Petaluma, because a lot of people want to know. It seems like Sonoma County has continually been one step behind in following the larger counties and school districts in the Bay Area and not keeping in step with them when it comes to attempts to halt community spread of COVID-19 to the larger populace. How do you answer, Wes? So again, we're doing things in a very evidence-based way. And we are behind other counties by one day in, uh, in starting the shelter in place because we don't have as many cases as them. And in fact, I think we're very proactive that we only actually have right now six cases and we've decided with the support of our Board of Supervisors and our other staff, um, like uh, you know, all of our stakeholders, we've decided to go forth even though we only have six cases. And I'm thinking that because we have done this, we may have even prevented some cases that might arise or at least delayed uh, the cases 
that might arise. And that's going to be really good, as you saw from the graph. Right. Uh, one question I had about the graph, uh, looking at those two curves, uh, is that the same number of people who will end up getting the disease in the end, or will the number, this absolute number mm -hmm. of people getting the disease be limited by this new uh, method of, of keeping away from each other? So this is a generic graph. <laughs> I, I understand. It's not tailored to our situation. So um, what we are planning to do, uh, I can talk about the modeling that we're planning on doing. It is a good time because we are going to have a better um, estimate mm -hmm. of our actual numbers of cases and how many we might um, avoid having or prevent by, by putting into place these measures by having um, a modeling study that we're starting. We've actually uh, are contracting with uh, a team in Imperial School in London that is very well known for doing modeling. In fact, this group has done modeling for tuberculosis, for seasonal and pandemic influenza for CDC, and has worked with WHO and globally. And we're very lucky that um, we've asked them to come help us out in this county. And based on our county specific numbers, they're going to do the modeling exercise and we'll have answers for you for things like that. They're also going to work with other counties in the Bay Area and do a Bay Area model for us. Okay, and finally, the last question about the sheltering in place. I've got an adequate pantry right now. If this lasts three weeks or longer, I'll have to buy some food. I'm assuming that grocery stores will be open and I can shop. Is that correct? Definitely. That is one of our defined essential businesses and they will be open. There's no need then to go and stock up on things because they're going to be open. Okay. Thanks uh, for those answers and uh, not neglecting the two of you. We'll have plenty of opportunity for you to uh, answer some of our questions. All right, Abia. Well, Dr. Mace, we have a few more questions for you. First, again, um, people really want to know about the cases right now, um, specifically, you know, who, who they are, where they are, and any information that might give them an idea of whether or not there's someone who's in their community or, or near them. Um, so can you tell us, first, we have a question from Gail, who asked specifically about the number of cases. Um, she's in Petaluma. She wants to know, where were the latest community cases found? And please don't say you can't release personal information. And she really wants to know specifically the name of the towns that the cases were in. Yes, so actually, we really can't release that kind of information. Uh, it's uh, patient confidential information. I think that people would understand that if they were the case, they probably wouldn't want their information out in the public either. So we can't specify locations, names, or any identifying factors. What I can say is that we do have the six cases, four of which we have diagnosed since Saturday, and that we are doing everything we can to identify people who've come into contact with these cases, follow them up. In fact, they're all been asked to self-quarantine and take their temperature and report if they have any symptoms or a fever to their doctor to be evaluated, to call their doctor and be evaluated. And we have uh, staff that's contacted all of them. So I want people to be reassured that we are doing everything we can to ensure that there isn't further spread of COVID-19 in our community. And are you able to elaborate on how those cases came to your attention? Were they, for example, through your surveillance project or through other known cases? So um, one of them so far and had, was definitely through the surveillance project. And so I'm really happy that we put that into place because now that we showed that that community transmission occurred, it allowed us to move forward with the health officer order because we know COVID-19 is out there. Uh, the other three cases we're still investigating. It appears that two of them are related to travel outside of our community. And then there's one more that we feel is probably community transmission. And can you elaborate a little bit more about your surveillance project? What are the next steps for that? And how many people have you tested so far through that? Right, so so far the public health lab has um, Per, uh, tested a total of 158 persons, uh, or actually 168, I believe it is, and we have 151 negatives, about 18 persons who are still under investigation. That means their tests are still pending, and the six cases. Um, and we intend to continue the enhanced surveillance project but it, because it's helping us find cases that we wouldn't otherwise find. So our uh, four, different, four to five different sites that are participating are on board, and in fact, are ramping up testing. We also got a number of questions specifically about 
the folks who were known to have some contact with either healthcare workers who were um, working with patients who were diagnosed with COVID-19 or people who were with the cruise ship passengers. Um, people wrote a ton of questions wanting to know, mm -hmm. have you followed up with all of their contacts yes. and have those tests all come back negative? But I want to read a specific question. This one's from Anonymous. What is the status of the 30 healthcare workers who self-quarantined after coming in contact with a known positive patient a week or so back? Um, most of the people who have self-quarantined are past their 14-day window, which means that they had no symptoms and they're back to our, their work or whatever other um, work that they're doing, whether it's a healthcare worker or not. Um, I can say that the cruise ship passengers, the 78 that we talked about, they're all past that 14-day window as well, and we had no further cases in that group. Uh, so most of the people who have come in contact have been evaluated and are either under quarantine under, for 14 days or past it. All right. Well, we have a few more questions about healthcare capacity, so we can involve um, Supervisor Gorin and Chris Godley a little bit more. Steve, you have those questions? Yes, thanks a lot, Adia. Let me toss out the first question. Please address the county action plan to provide additional facilities should our hospitals become overloaded. We've been paying attention to Italy, and the problems there are frightening. They are. We've seen a lot of reports from around the world, the extraordinary efforts that the Chinese people undertook to make, contain their efforts. We've seen what's going on in Italy and Iran and all these other countries. And so, of course, as we look to help soften or flatten that curve, of course, the question is, can we get it down far enough that our system can handle it? Well, let's be honest, our medical health care system is already full. We've already got a highly efficient system, but there's not much additional capacity already built into it. So we're looking at a couple different ways to build additional capacity for what could be a potential bump, if you would. The first, of course, is the medical health care providers themselves. We have world-class medical institutions in our community with our hospitals, medical clinics, private practice. Our goal is to look to see, and internally, how can they maximize those capabilities? Are there potential ways to divert individuals from coming into the system? Of course, elective surgeries, that kind of thing. But they also have internal plans already in place where they can surge capacities inside their own institutions. For example, the hospitals can put additional beds in treatment rooms or exam rooms, for example, where they would normally wouldn't have patients. Now, this is usually done for an event like a mass casualty incident or potentially even just a severe traditional flu season. Well, that may not be enough. So we're undertaking a significant effort in partnership with these same healthcare providers to really look at how we can build additional facilities. We call them alternate care sites. And here we're looking at the potential for housing potentially hundreds of individuals in a safe and caring environment where we can provide high-grade medical care because we know that in past previous epidemics and pandemics that this may be the measures we need to undertake. And so to that end, that is pretty much our chief priority at this point, is developing the capability so that it will be there in time for the people when they need it. Well, I know I read that in China there was some kind of an intermediate step mm -hmm. where if someone was in a family, they were not thrown back with their family if they did test positive, but there were sort of fever rooms or rooms that they could not, didn't need full medical care. Any possibility of that in our county here? We are looking at the potential for providing opportunities for quarantine. This might be for individuals that are afraid of infecting family members mm -hmm. or folks that may not be able to care for themselves normally. And so we're working with the state of California not only to develop those alternate care sites, but potentially facilities that could house hundreds of individuals in our county if they needed to go into quarantine. All right, that's great. There's another question uh, along this line. How many ventilator and ICU mm -hmm. beds are available in Sonoma County? Mm -hmm. Are those of us who have lingering, sometimes permanent lung damage from the last three fire seasons mm -hmm. at increased risk mm -hmm. for this respiratory illness? So maybe that's a two-part question, maybe mm -hmm. Chris uh, or Susan, uh, sure. the first mm -hmm. part. And sure, just in terms of logistics and sheer numbers, again, a wealth of hospitals in the county, approximately about 800 beds, if you would, and of the specifically to the question, the intensive care unit beds, yeah. about 76. Now, it's important to note they're not just lying empty. Mm -hmm. We use them 90% full all the time because that's what we've built to, is to make sure we can accommodate regular needs of our community. 
And so when we talk about the surge, those are the areas we have to invest heavily in is those acute care settings, the ability to provide for the interventions, the treatments that are going to be needed for individuals that may be seriously ill. All right, Susan, you know, this is a budgetary question. When Chris comes to you and says, we need these extra beds, we need this extra capacity, we don't know if we need it, but we think we may need it. What does the Board of Supervisors say at that point? Well, we did take an action today uh, authorizing $1 million in expenditures for all of the preparations that we are now undergoing. Uh, we know that uh, personnel and communications are always very expensive, but the Board is ready and able and willing to devote our reserves to look at some of the preparations that Chris talked about in evaluating the need for hospital beds, identifying what we have and the gap that we may see if our curves and modeling uh, prove to be accurate. So I think that's what is our reserves are for, for emergencies. Uh, and I just wanted to say we're so fortunate to have th these two individuals with us right now. We uh, are battle-hardened, as they say, through a number of disasters and emergencies. But this is different. And it, we have faith in public health. They've always been part of our emergency preparedness. But uh, Chris has done an, just an incredible job of forging those communication pathways with our city schools, special partners, certainly with our public health institutions now. And it, it is really serving us in times of need. I also want to say that elected officials across the nation must be absolutely frantic trying to field phone calls from constituents who are extremely anxious, worried about the spread of the virus, certainly worried about what the economic impacts might be uh, from our mandatory sheltering in place, and recognizing that many employees will be laid off. Uh, some of the employees may be assigned uh, duties to support some of those essential critical functions. But nevertheless, we are ready, able, and willing uh, for the supervisors to pitch in, establish communication channels with all of the, our spectrum of community groups and individuals and leaders to try to understand what the needs are in our community, especially those who are most vulnerable, either our seniors at health risks or those folks who are experiencing uh, layoff notices and loss of incomes, worried about evictions, worried about deportations. Mm -hmm. And I just want to assure everybody that we are very aware of the fragility of our economy, how it affects everyone in Sonoma County and across the nation. We know that our state and federal governments are also looking at this, and we want to hear from you, and we've divided up the lanes, so to speak, so that each supervisor could then uh, focus on community wellness, uh, the Latinx and equity across Sonoma County, business across the board from large employers to small employers to self-employed as well as our agricultural and tourism industries so we want to make ourselves useful as information gathering and allow our incredible professionals to focus on what they need to do to respond to the emergency and public health crisis that we have currently sure and we'll have some more questions about the economy in just a minute let me take though the second part of that question that we just asked, yeah. are there are those of us who have lingering, sometimes permanent lung damage from the last three fire seasons at increased risk? Is this an increased risk group if they catch the coronavirus? Well, people that have underlying lung disease definitely are at increased risk. Um, it could be due to uh, COPD from different factors, exposures. So fire could certainly play into that. Uh, so if we if COVID is like any other bacterial pathogen or viral pathogen, then people are definitely likely to be you increased You said that risk. pretty fast. It's like any other... So if hmm. COVID is like any other virus or bacteria, okay. then yes, people with underlying lung disease are definitely at increased risk. All right. And one more question on this from Monterio from Anonymous. What happens if an employee of our only chain grocery store in Guerneville 
test positive for the virus, and what about there's only two pharmacies in Guerneville? If someone in one of those grocery stores or pharmacies test positive, and the folks there decide that they can't uh, leave the places open, then then what are the plans? Well, actually, let me jump in there, and this is really talking about the fact that our community is going to be strained potentially. We have a lot of key people in a lot of key positions. And so, for example, for Safeway, Safeway is actually hiring staff now because of this increased demand where people are preparing more meals at home. And so we're going to be working with them to say, look, if you have a, a vulnerability or an issue at one location, how can we help you keep that open? Do you need just additional staff? Do you need transportation, security? Whatever the issue is, we want to keep that vital resource open to the community. And that extends into medical health, too. We're going to be looking at being able to potentially move staff around as needed if we have strength in the Sonoma Valley because they've done such a great job. And we may need to go out to West County. That would be our goal to help broker that. You can move health care providers around. We cannot order them to. But <laughs> uh -huh. we believe we've got working relationships and a level of trust that will allow us to put those needs out. And like the rest of the community in Sonoma Strong, we expect and we really believe they will step up to take care of business. The answer is not just government. It's people helping out each other, solving the problems directly in front of them. And we believe that's one of the great strengths we have as a county, as a community going into this event. And just a reminder, if uh, someone would like to join us in Spanish, we are having a simulcast on uh, La Mejor 104.1 in the Santa Rosa area and you can listen in Spanish and see us moving our lips in English and hopefully that'll be a, an okay experience for you. Okay, Adia, if yes I please. I can just add to the response. Yes. Um, the person who's diagnosed would be immediately quarantined right. and taken care of appropriately. Okay. All persons who may have come in close contact would also be evaluated mm -hmm. and um, possibly also be self-quarantined. And the surfaces would all be clean. So when new mm -hmm. workers come in, it would be very safe mm -hmm. again. Okay, thanks for that clarification. That's great. All right, Adia? Yeah, first of all, I want to remind people that if they have a question, they can write to us at viewer at norcalpublicmedia.org. We're also on social media at norcalpublic. And the next set of questions all pertain to how to protect yourselves. Mm -hmm. So first of all, does the order to shelter in place, does that change any of the advice you've been giving out about how to best protect yourself? Is there anything else that people should know when they're preparing to go buy groceries that they should do that they haven't been doing the past few weeks? And this is for Dr. Mays. Yes, I, that's a good question. Yeah, I think the guidance we've given so far is accurate and that people should continue doing all the things that we've said. Good personal hygiene. We talked about hand washing with soap and water for 20 seconds frequently, the use of hand sanitizer to make sure that if you touch surfaces that are in public places that and don't touch your face, your nose, eyes, or mouth, wash your hands uh, in between, uh, and make sure that you keep uh, distance from people. Uh, six foot distance is what we're suggesting. So if you go out uh, now with the shelter in place, in place, uh, if you go to buy groceries or go to the pharmacy, anywhere you go, try to follow the social distancing guidance. Can I add uh, something because a lot of emphasis has been placed on seniors over the age of 65. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm outing myself. <laughs> I am one of those. And in fact, I did uh, self-shelter today during the board meeting trying to call in. It just pointed out the fragility of our technological ability to participate in those kind of things. Right, you told me you could not lead the board meeting from uh, your bedroom. It was really frustrating for me, and I couldn't maintain a phone line. We're working on that. Uh, interestingly, because this is uh, perhaps setting a new paradigm for working, uh, maybe this is what we will be doing more of in the future with video conferencing, uh, remote uh, distancing, working from home, telecommuting, and that may contribute to uh, lowering our greenhouse gas emissions as well as increasing flexibility for employees. But I know that this is a really difficult, anxious time for our seniors. Uh, we know that seniors have some underlying health conditions and they should be especially concerned about venturing out in the community. Don't be shy about asking your family members or friends or neighbors to do a little shopping for me, for you, for your needs. 
and neighbors, please reciprocate. Uh, reach out to those seniors living in your community. What are their needs? Perhaps you could do an errand for them. Uh, an interesting suggestion came from a couple of people today. How about if we have grocery stores setting aside senior hours mm -hmm. so that seniors would feel more comfortable venturing to the grocery stores uh, just as they do senior Tuesdays? Maybe we should have some senior hours for some of our grocery stores. That's a great idea, Susan. Thank you so much. All right, Adia? Yeah, and will there be any guidelines for people who work in grocery stores on how to protect themselves. You know, another really common question we got in was from people who are working in grocery stores who are really scared right now because mm -hmm. they do have to go to work. They are important to be there, but they're worried that they're exposed to a lot of different people. What should they be doing? We don't have any separate guidance for people who work in grocery stores, but they fall in the category of persons who uh, generally food service, people who work in restaurants, because their restaurants would still be open for takeout and delivery and things like that. So still the standard uh, recommendations we've been giving all along, hand washing and personal hygiene, social distancing. At this point, that's what we have okay. in place. So I want to read a question. This one's about N95 masks. I know we've talked a lot about this already, but we're still getting a lot of questions into our newsroom about whether or not people should be wearing masks. So this is from Melinda. Are N95 masks protective against the virus? It seems as though the public is being discouraged from buying them to make them available for first responders. But many of us already have them at home due to the wildfires. So if they are useful, um, when, we, when we must go out for groceries or to fetch something, can we use them? Yeah, our guidance is still not to use N95 masks in the public for many reasons. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons, of course, is a shortage for healthcare personnel. But even if you have them at home, these are masks that have to be fit tested for individuals. So it's a procedure that's done in the hospital where, you know, it's, it takes about 10 minutes. There's different sizes. And if you have the wrong size mask, you may even be at more risk because these masks create a negative kind of suction when you breathe in. And if they don't fit appropriately, the sides could open up and you may actually be getting more exposure if there's virus on the mask for example. So um, it's more than just that they're not effective because they don't fit, but they could actually put you at more risk. So we really suggest that people don't use them. Interesting. Okay, well, this next question was directed for um, you, Susan, although I believe Dr. Mace already answered it a little bit in part um, about the masks, but it's from another anonymous person. Um, I've heard that your employees in law enforcement jails are not wearing masks unless someone is sick. So we all know that the coronavirus can be transmitted by an asymptomatic person. Why is the county not being more proactive to stop the spread? And why are people who work with the public not wearing masks? And I'm not sure that I can answer that, but maybe Chris can. Well, I think the major reason is, as the doctor indicated, the masks are not only challenging because they have to be fit tested appropriately and they can cause risk, but I'll also share with you many people when they put on the mask, they now think they're safe and they begin to undertake even more riskier behaviors and contacts than they might otherwise. Now it's important to note when to put on the mask is when you may be ill so that you can stop the spread of disease to others. So in that case we're implementing uh, processes whereby if individuals are ill or symptomatic then we ask them to wear that mask to protect others. All right. We had another anonymous question about buying vegetables from the grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Probably best for you, Dr. Mace. Yes. Um, should we not buy fresh vegetables at the grocery store because they have inevitably been handled by farm workers, processors, store staff, and consumers? A good question again. Um, we are asking that farmers markets try to bag produce so we don't get into that situation where people are touching uh, the different uh, vegetables and fruits. But as we always have said, when you buy fruits and vegetables, you have to wash them thoroughly before you consume them. So I would just give the exact same guidance. You can buy fruits and vegetables and other um, items at farmer's markets. Just make sure that they're clean. Do Go through the normal process you would anyhow before you eat them. All right. Well, we want to get into talking about testing here, since I know a lot of people are concerned about that. So Steve, I'll let you pick up. All right. Thanks a lot, Edia. Uh, here's a question from uh, Liz Kane of Healdsburg. Are there enough tests for everyone in the county? Globally, there are reported cases of people with no symptoms. How do we know for sure that a community member, myself included, is not infected without testing, especially now that people without risk 
factors or even symptoms are coming up positive and spreading the disease? I think it's a really good question. Uh, again, I think it's a hard question because we do need to use the tests and our resources, not just the test kits, but our healthcare workers that are testing persons and the swabs that are being used to test, uh, the you know test tubes, the protective gear people are wearing when they do the testing. We need to make sure that we uh, reserve or preserve these resources for people who are ill and symptomatic. We're not going to know um, how much virus there is amongst asymptomatic persons until we go out and test everybody. And at this plan, at this time that is, that's not the plan in the county to test everyone. I don't know if anybody wants to well, add me, to that. Well, let me yeah. just, the, the first part has sort of a yes or no answer. Mm -hmm. Do you, the three of you, feel there are enough tests that you have access to in the county for the uses that you need to have? Definitely. Them? There are enough Definitely. Tests. We're able to test 100 to 120 persons in our public health lab, and our uh, lab director orders the tests ahead. 120 a day? Yeah, a day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, out of 500,000 people who live in the county, right. you're feeling like we only need to test 120 a day? Well, right now it's not exceeding our capability, also partially because our commercial labs are actually picking up the slack and mm -hmm. testing as well. So Quest and LabCorp are both testing. And Quest is now able to really ramp up the numbers. Um, so I think we're able to meet the, uh, the need with the commercial labs and our public health lab. What we're asking our providers to do is to send specimens for really ill people or persons hospitalized or people who are very symptomatic to our public health lab mm -hmm. so we can get the results quickly within 24 hours. Okay. Um, this was a question that was asked uh, at the KBBF forum. What about tests for people who have no doctors, who have no regular mm -hmm. medical care providers? Tell us, you know, uh, exactly what should they do? And, and I would say we have a very robust uh, system of community health clinics, and that's the situation that people in the community should go in, or at least call them if they appear to be symptomatic. We're recommending that if you do have some symptoms, please don't just go in. Call ahead first uh, and then get the advice from the physician. So where can they find the information about the free clinics? And the free clinics are just about in every community. Certainly we have them up north in Hillsburg and West County, uh, Sonoma Valley, Santa Rosa for sure. If you look into the phone book or online for community health centers, okay. you will find a listing of that. I wanted to respond to the anxiousness around testing. Please. We, I, I totally understand where community members are come from. They might be standing behind someone in line, coughing and sneezing and, oh no, I need to be tested. And that's when you call your healthcare professional or your community clinic to explain the circumstances of why you think you need a test. More often than not, that's probably not the case, but that's why we have our public health uh, officer and department to really track down those things. But please go on to the frequently asked questions. That will give you that's great... That's at socoemergency.org? Socoemergency.org. It will give you all of the protocols and or call 211. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anybody can take care, advantage of that. They can call 211. They can go on socoemergency.org and look at the frequently asked questions. And okay. I believe the testing is free, but, sure. uh, but we don't, other areas do have drive-by testing. We do not. It's not what we have indicated yet in Sonoma County. And oh, 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 is, is that true? Is there, well, is there have, some drive-by? We have some. We have some. Not everybody is doing the drive-by or parking lot testing. Yeah. But I think the last I heard the update from this week is that Sutter is doing this. A Kaiser has started doing this, Memorial is doing this, okay. and Alliance, I think, as well, but only for their own patients. Um, I think still many people can get care at the uh, community health clinics. And I do want to, again, plug uh, 211 because you can get somebody on the line who can answer your question 24-7. Okay. Another question about tests, and this is, again, of the many flooding in. Jenny Belfort, Petaluma, Sonoma County. I had the flu with a fever last mm -hmm. week. My son had it this week. Mm -hmm. We called Kaiser both times, and we were told we would not be tested. 
I'm very worried that people are sick with coronavirus, mm -hmm. and we just don't know it because we're not testing. We have artificially low reported rates, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Um, I think <laughs> that, you know, there is some validity to the fact that we don't have the numbers to really um, have accurate numbers of how, what percentage of our population is infected. Now, if you look at the studies that have been published, 80% of people who get the COVID-19 are not very symptomatic, right. or they're not symptomatic at all. Right. And it's only the other 20% that get ill, and of those, 14% or so get moderately ill, and about 5% get severely ill. And again, we're seeing that illness in older folks, that really severe illness more in older folks. So, um, you know, I can't speak to this caller's specific situation, but the testing is available for everybody who needs it. All right. Well, everyone who needs it, let me just say, when you say that 80% are largely non-symptomatic or mildly Mildsome, symptomatic, yes. mm -hmm. there was some reporting uh, earlier this week uh, that those people may be spreading the mm -hmm. coronavirus yeah. mm -hmm. more. There, there's mm -hmm. language for it. Are they throwing mm -hmm. off the virus? I don't know how a mm -hmm. public health official or a doctor mm -hmm. would talk about it. Is there any indication that people who are asymptomatic or not symptomatic at all might be spreading this faster? Yeah, there is definitely some uh, data that suggests that maybe people who aren't symptomatic can spread the virus. But keep in mind that people who are really symptomatic are probably much more likely to spread. And so that, that scientific uh, information you're giving us, that, that you, you have determined or people have determined that the symptomatic folks are more likely to spread than the asymptomatic Well, that's folks. something that is with any pathogen. Okay. The people that have a higher burden mm -hmm. of the virus or the bacteria, whatever it is, are more likely to spread. Oh, but in this case, there is some um, thought that asymptomatic people, we've seen that it looks like asymptomatic people might be able to spread the virus. It's not something that's confirmed, it's something that needs more study. Remember, this is a novel virus mm -hmm. and we're still trying to understand how it infects people. Fabulous, okay, thank you so much. Uh, Adia, you had some questions about the economic impact that people have been sending in to us. Certainly, people are very concerned at this point about their businesses, about what they're going to do if they have to close their businesses. Um, so the first question is from Tammy. I believe we answered must all businesses close, but let's talk about if we must close, is unemployment insurance available? Supervisor Gorin, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, it is. And in fact, business loss insurance is then triggered by the mandatory order that has been issued. And we've rec I've received a number of inquiries from business owners saying, please make it mandatory so that my business loss insurance will then be triggered or my employees can access unemployment insurance. And I get also get inquiries from folks say, please make it mandatory because I am fearful about working in an unprotected environment. And yet I have a lot of business owners, especially in our agricultural sector with our wineries saying, please don't shut us down. This is a crucial time for us for bottling and shipping. And we would lay off 500 to thousands of employees. And so I think that the mandatory order was uh, devised very carefully to account for both the economic significance of Sonoma County and also the critical nature of some of those businesses that were exempted from the order. So congratulations to that. But I am very aware that the economic impacts will be significant. We've had surveys after our past fires and power shutdowns trying to understand the economic impacts of the folks in the community, businesses and employees, undoubtedly we will do the same thing. But this time the, the uh, coronavirus is so widespread that our federal and state governments are really being very thoughtful about the kind of economic stimulus packages they are approving or the special uh, um, information and, and benefits from for those people that are significantly affected by the shutdowns. 
Right. I think, you know, we've certainly seen a lot of frustration on both ends of the spectrum, people being frustrated that the order to shelter in place didn't come sooner, people being frustrated that there's one at all because mm -hmm. of the impacts on businesses. So the next question is from Anonymous. My question is, what will be done to help small business owners in particular if we have to cancel jobs and there is no revenue? What about the hundreds of thousands of dollars of lost income from forcing people to stay home, and how do we expect businesses to recover? So, Dr. Mace, I kind of pin this one for, for you, for the first part at least. Mm -hmm. um, how do you address that concern that maybe this is a little too extreme, that this mm -hmm. is causing damage to the economy when maybe it's not necessary? Yeah, well, I, you know, I really have more of the medical and clinical <laughs> right. and program perspective on this, but I can say that, you know, we, there are so many essential businesses that have an exemption to this that I think the impact will be less, uh, definitely. I mean, you should see it's a laundry list. Tell us I a mean, couple of those. Sure. Okay, so let me <laughs> go to... The businesses. So obviously, you know, healthcare uh, workers, healthcare facilities, uh, essential infrastructure. Those are important. And we already talked about all the, the stores, the grocery stores, the markets, the uh, even produce markets. Um, you know, uh, convenience stores, etc. Agricultural, food and beverage cultivation, processing and distribution for farming, for ranching, fishing, uh, dairies, creameries, wineries, breweries. So that means not retail. So they're not going to have their you know, tasting rooms open, but they can certainly package and ship um, product. So they that can harvest be... what's in the field if they need to. Absolutely. Okay. So that part of the business won't be impacted. So uh, businesses that provide food, shelter, and social services, you all, media, newspapers, television, gas stations, auto supply, auto repair, hardware stores, plumbers, electricians, and uh, exterminators. I mean, it's on. it goes on and on. Sure. Well, that so, gives us you know, an idea. So it's actually, you know, laundromats. That was a question that <laughs> came up before. Right. So, uh, oh, and restaurants, I want to say, are really important because we don't want people congregating in restaurants, sitting and eating together. However, for takeout or delivery, drive throughs that should all be fine. Um, well, just, yesterday you know, the governor said you know, sit two tables apart or something, you're going beyond that. Now. We're going beyond that because I think it's really, we already found that it's very hard to implement yes. this, six, I mean, we're not really six <laughs> feet apart here. No. So if you think about it, Forgive it's us. quite difficult to implement. And a shelter in place will not work unless people abide by it. So in order for us to flatten the curve and to decrease the number of cases so that we can move on from this pandemic, people really have to um, obey the order, is what I'm going to say. You know, they need to, as much as possible, stay at home and shelter in place. And this has the force of law. What you're saying, it, it, on the one hand, it has the force of law. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we should not expect the police to be out. Well, for, tell me about the timing. It said, when is midnight Wednesday? Is that tonight that or is, tomorrow night? That is actually tonight. <laughs> okay. So we're talking by 12.01 1 a.m. Wednesday, Wednesday. Uh, mm -hmm. March 18th. Mm -hmm. Yes. This order goes into effect. Okay, sorry, Chris, right. I interrupted. So no, enforcement's a big component of this because it is a health order. It does carry the penalty of a misdemeanor under California code. But in Sonoma County, we're really looking at not just the individuals complying with it, but we want to make sure the institutions themselves are really addressing this need. So if, God forbid, somebody says, you know what, I'm just going to stay open, I'm going to serve drinks at my bar or whatever, we might not go after, say, a criminal enforcement. We're not going to ask our police officers to pull people over and check papers. We're not a lockdown like Italy is. We're actually looking at perhaps identifying an individual that may be causing risk for the community by really understanding that they're not only disobeying the law, they're disobeying the spirit, the intent of trying to protect ourselves. And so in that case, we might seek a civil injunction or something a bit milder initially to go after that potential trouble spot. And Chris, just the, the phrase check papers is something that causes alarm oh, yes. bells to ring in the yes. county. So mm -hmm. let us reinforce the idea that none of the police forces in Sonoma County mm -hmm will care if people are documented, undocumented, mm -hmm. if they're citizens, if they're visitors. Mm -hmm. No one is going to be, quote unquote, checking papers in that sense. ICE is not involved, mm -hmm. and our entire community is pulling together uh, despite you know, the, the situation we might be in on the national level. Am Absolutely. We, we don't change the way we do business relative to this issue. And I'd ask Supervisor Gorn to 
really express the intent of the community at large regarding this? I think we really have to acknowledge why we are doing this. Um, we are facing a pandemic. We need to take it seriously. We need to come together as a community and respond to this and make a social compact that we are not going to put anyone else at risk. And it doesn't matter what our age range is, uh, social gathering is a challenge. I think our millennials are sometimes better equipped uh, than everybody else because they're already attuned to their social media at home, uh, sheltering in place. Uh, it's just the rest of us that have this need to get out and talk with folks and gather together. It's a different world. We can do this, but we have to reaffirm why we're doing this. This is really important uh, to curtail and contain and mitigate the spread of the pandemic. But I also would say that some of the exempt businesses currently are office supply stores because many of the jobs are able to be performed remotely. And that is true of many of the county functions. We've spent the last couple of days uh, understanding what the critical functions are, what the essential functions are, and asking everybody else to work remotely from home. And that means uh, working with IT to make sure we can get our computer stations up and running, that we've cleared off that desk, have a work environment uh, for us to be functional, have a phone, uh, being able to communicate with each other. So I think it's, it's yes, it is uh, concerning to those folks who uh, are, need to be working out in the, in the fields. Will they be losing income perhaps? But many of us can function, at least in the short term, very sustainably. Sure. We're Abby, some we have some uh, great, calls. Great questions into the studio. Again, if you have a question, you can write to us at viewer at norcalpublicmedia.org. We're also on social media at norcalpublic. Uh, Supervisor Gorin, how will the county do shelter in place with the homeless? And will police be blocked from walking and moving homeless people during this time? That's an excellent question. I do know of the operation of the shelters. They have uh, eliminated the contact with volunteers. And that's really sad because so many volunteers come together uh, to prepare foods or guide hikes or have art and recreational facilities. And many of them are seniors who want to contribute. And especially seniors, we say, please don't. Uh, shelter in place and at least temporarily uh, curtail your volunteer involvement. But let's drill down a little bit on yes. this homeless issue. What are we doing specifically for our homeless population? I, I think they are ex doing exactly what we're doing, sheltering in place. In, in, the, in, the, in the streets, in, 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 the, in the tents? In, in, in the shelters. I, I, I think that, and I'll let well, the, the order doctor. Very specifically says, that we're exempting individuals experiencing homelessness mm -hmm. from the shelter in place order, but urging them to find shelter and government agencies to provide it. So uh, it, it is a good way for us actually to get homeless people housed. Okay, Adia, more questions? Yeah, um, will there be a moratorium on evictions during this time? And what protections are available to families from being evicted? Um, or losing income, and what about those who currently have a notice to vacate? Uh, that's um, a really challenging for our community. Many people will lose income. Uh, they may not be able to pay rent. We want to ensure that they don't become part of our homeless population. Right. I think uh, government at all levels is looking at what this means. But on the other hand, we have people who are, um, who are landlords. And what happens if, if the evictions are stopped and they don't have income? Do they lose the houses uh, that they are renting out or the apartment buildings? It's a difficult situation. The board has not had an opportunity to really identify what kind of policy options we are able to take other than we just got a, a notice from the auditor, controller, tax collector. We do not have the ability to extend that deadline on collecting property taxes that comes from the state level. And so we're looking for guidance uh, from the state level on many of these provisions. Sure, Susan, uh, just to press you a little bit, I know other uh, jurisdictions have stopped evictions. Uh, San Francisco today, I heard, and other places in the East Bay. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy, 
but other places have done it. It's an important conversation, and okay. we have not had the uh, ability yet because we're in a week or two or three time lag sure. from the other jurisdictions. Uh, there will come a time, I think, sooner rather than later, but quite frankly, I'm nervous that we're going to stop our board meetings for the next week or two, and that would prevent us from considering even even more policy options. Okay. So all of those sure. are, are legitimate concerns mm -hmm. and should be available for conversation. And we're just grappling with trying to understand what the sheltering in place and the mandatory uh, order means for us because it will affect many employees. Sure. A couple of quick questions. Will there be mail delivery, UPS, FedEx? Are they exempted? Are they on the um, list? They should be on the exempted list. I, I would, I would say, think that's an essential service. Okay, so we'll still get our mail. If the FedEx man or woman comes, the UPS person comes, they're going to still be coming. Deliveries will come, I think, even from online sources and things okay. like that. Okay. What mm -hmm. do people who do not have sick leave or vacation time to use yeah. do while they're sheltering in place? Yeah. What can, what are people supposed to do? That's lost income, and it's many questions have arisen from the community about that. Can we institute and require employers to pay sick pay? But that's part of the labor law, and again, that's something that we need to research and figure that out. Right, good. Now, uh, Dr. Mace, I know um, all day you've been waiting to come here tonight. Was there something that you had hoped to say to the community that you didn't have a chance to say in the in the minute or so remaining? Yes, definitely. I just want to let people know that this is a very, very important order. And I know it's going to be hard for the community to shelter in place, but we absolutely have to, each one of us, do our piece. I'm asking everybody to please consider following this order because we need to get over this pandemic and this is one way in which we can do so. So we need your help. And we, okay. yes, that's the message I want to give today. Well, thanks. That's a, a great message. And uh, I really appreciate the three of you coming. You know, two weeks in a row uh, has been uh, astonishing to me that your commitment to coming, to, to communicating. I hope those uh, who were able to hear the program in Spanish were able to do it at 104.1 La Mejor or others in the community were able to hear a fully Spanish town hall on KBBF this afternoon. And Adia White has been with me, as well as Dr. Sundari Mace, Susan Gorin, and Christopher Godley. Thanks so much. <laughs>